Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's webinar. It's 9.01, so let's get started. I had a few late uh, webinar registrations this morning, so we're just giving them the connection instructions, and we'll give them a minute to join us here. Uh, I hope wherever you are in Canada or elsewhere, the weather's better than where I am. We had a nice thunder and lightning storm last night, and when you look in the newspaper, there's flooding on Main Street and other streets, and you keep thinking, where's the summer? But but it's coming. So welcome again. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is about hope as a root cause. This is your first webinar with us. I'd just like to introduce who we are and to orient you to the, the webinar interface so you can participate, especially in the question and answer uh, phase of the webinar. So Equiate, we're a, a relatively new organization. We're a consulting firm based in Alberta, Canada. Our focus is solving social problems. We offer free webinars as part of our work. So in June, we are offering five. Uh, this is our third webinar, Hope is a Root Cause. We have two more next week, and every month you know, from now on, we'll be offering at least two webinars that will be of interest to people who are working on health or social problems. If you look at the webinar interface, you'll see on the top there, um, my mood icon kind of right above the slide with the half figure of a person above it. If you hover your mouse over that, you'll see you can do a thumbs up or a thumb down or raise your hand or indicate you're fine. Uh, when it gets time to the question and answer portion of the webinar towards the end, uh, how we'll do it is if you have a question, if you click the, the raise hand portion of the question, uh, it'll show up beside your name there on the screen on the left where the list of participants is. And then either you can ask your question, you know, if your audio is working on your computer or if you're on the phone, or you can type it into the chat window and we'll all see your question and we'll be able to discuss it. Just to make sure that's working, could I, could I have you go there and, and give me a thumbs up for uh, not quite so sunny Thursday morning? Hoping for better weather soon. Thank you. Looks like it's working good. All right. I'd like to start today's webinar by describing a bit about how I became interested in the topic of hope. You know, hope's one of these topics I think we all have a connection to it, but often that connection's more on a personal level or of a personal interest than a professional level or something we we do in our day-to-day our -day work. This goes way back to when I was in school and before I, I got into public health I was doing other things and one of my classes was on healthcare systems and as part of a reading assignment um, we got to read this book you may be familiar with Why Are Some People Healthy and Others Not edited by Robert Evans, Morris Baer and uh, Theodore Marmor and the first two chapters in particular, one was the introduction and then one was all about determinants of health. In this book, um, I was smitten. You know, it literally changed my life. It led me into public health and the focus on the gradient in health, which they so cleverly described and made the case for. So I was kind of late to the scene. You know, the book was published in 1994 and I first came across it in 2002. I was catching up on research and activity in this area and I found two what I considered very interesting themes. One was the search for root causes, this whole idea of you know, root causes as important areas to focus on. Second, the sensitivity or challenge of the so what question. I'll come back to that. But first, root causes. And the search for root causes is simply that. There are many, many issues out there. Many of them are interdependent. For example, healthy diet depends on your education, your knowledge, it depends on your income, your access, they're all connected. Where possible, rather than focus on each issue on its own, it seems wise to identify and address root causes instead. And the natural analogy of, of a tree, you know, if you've ever, ever pruned a tree or dug up a tree, it's much more effective to work at the roots than to work at the leaves or the branches. So the search for root causes of health and equity we go to the research led by Michael Marmot and others. In summarizing his research on the topic, this is what he said. He said, autonomy, how much control you have over your life, 
and the opportunities you have for full social engagement and participation are crucial for health, well-being, and longevity. Autonomy, he identified as a root cause. Let's ad- apply autonomy to healthy eating as an example of showing it as a root cause. Healthy eating, as we know, it prevents many risk factors for disease, including overweight and obesity. Healthy eating depends on knowledge. We need to know what to eat in order to eat healthy. But most who eat a less than healthy diet don't do so because they don't know any different. Other factors are at play. Perhaps their food budget is small, too small to meet recommendations for a healthy diet. Perhaps they have transportation barriers that prevent them from accessing resources that can make a healthy diet doable. Perhaps there are just other priorities in their budgeting that place a healthy diet further down the list. What all of these share is the ability of the individual to influence whether or not they eat a healthy diet, how much of it is under their control. This is their autonomy, the amount of control they have over whether they eat a healthy diet. If they are constrained in their choices by income and other factors, these factors limit their autonomy. These other factors are important, but each is in one way, but each is one way in which autonomy is limited. Autonomy lies at the root. On the second point, the challenge of the so what question, this is particularly intriguing. In the forward to the 1999 edition of the Social Determinants of Health, if you remember that book, it's uh, the orange covered one, there's a little picture of it there. Michael Marmot stated, those of us involved in research on social inequalities in health feel particularly vulnerable on the so what question. Time and again, we have been confronted by the question of whether research on social inequalities in health has any practical application. It seems that when the topic is health inequity, which in turn is related so strongly to social inequity, the obvious solution of social change stops us in our tracks. It's too big and too difficult. Hope offers insights on both of these points. We'll make the case today that hope is the root cause of health and well-being, and that hope offers a program and policy perspective that is very actionable and consistent with the need to address social inequities in order to improve health inequities. Our webinar will follow the format of first, describing the concept of hope, second, making the case for hope as a root cause, third, describing the process of developing hope, and fourth, exploring a framework for the application of hope. First, what is hope? When you dig into it, Hope is perhaps one of the most misused words in the English language. Hope's a concept of staying power. It's been featured in ancient myths, such as the Greek myths about Pandora's box, and in ancient scriptures, such as the New Testament. There's lots of teachings about hope and faith and charity, for example. It's been featured in modern political campaigns. It was a key slogan for President Obama. And in best-selling books, two that come to mind, um, Norman Cousins, The Biology of Hope and the Healing Power of the Human Spirit, Head first, and Jerome Groupman, The Anatomy of Hope. Some people hope to one day win the lottery. Others hope to one day harvest the fruits of their labors. So what is hope? Let's start with the dif- dictionary definition, just for fun, and then we'll jump into the literature and see what it adds to us. From the dictionary, hope is defined as both a verb and a noun. As a verb, hope is defined as one, to cherish a desire with anticipation, i.e. hoping for a promotion or a piece of chocolate cake, whatever the case may be. Two, to desire with expectation of obtainment. Three, to expect with confidence and trust. Each of these definitions shares a sense of an orientation towards a future happening, although with different degrees of expectation. For example, cherish, desire, expect. We consider hope as a noun defined as desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment, i.e., I came in hopes of seeing you. Two, someone or something on which hopes are centered. You're our only hope for victory. You watched the hockey game last night, and those goalies are the only hope for victory, it seems. Three, something hoped for. So common to these definitions of hope, both as a verb and a noun, is a future orientation towards something different than what's in the present. Leaving the dictionary aside, 
what does the literature add to our understanding of hope? First, we'll go to psychiatry. The psychiatrist Anthony Redding defined hope as a pleasurable subjective state that arises when individuals expect that a desired future goal is realistically achievable and that expectation energizes them to initiate activities they believe will help them attain it. I just want to pause here. I just got a message from Shauna that she just has audio and isn't able to see the slides. Is anyone else experiencing that as well? Maybe if somebody could uh, just chat there if anybody else is having difficulty and seeing the slides. Okay. John, are you connected by telephone or by computer? You can just uh, chat in there and, and um, type in and let me know. Maybe if you just try a um, computer, you'll check with IT, okay. And perhaps try reconnecting. Um, perhaps the slides will appear then. It seems to be, if everyone else can see them, it seems to be something to do with your connection. I, I apologize for that. We are recording this webinar, so it will be available uh, online after today. So be sure to, to make that available as well. So back to the definition. Let me reread the definition from the psychiatrist Anthony Redding. The hope is a pleasurable subjective state that arises when individuals expect that a desired future goal is realistically achievable, and that expectation energizes them to initiate activities they believe will help them attain it. So Dr. Redding's definition adds an energizing action component directed towards a desired future state and a focus on realistically achievable goals. Hope, therefore, differs from other types of expectation about the future, such as daydreams or wishes, in that A, it's based on what are believed to be realistic predictions, and B, it leads to actions aimed at achieving the desired goals. Therefore, a statement similar to, I hope I win the lotto, does not represent hope at all, but simple optimism. I'm reminded here of Admiral Stockdale, you may be familiar with his story, has been told many times. Um, one was by Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great. <coughs> Admiral Stockdale was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And when interviewed about the experience and about those who survived the war as prisoners, he commented that they confronted the brutal facts of their situation and were not optimists. That there were many that hoped the war would be over by Christmas and pinned their hopes on that. When Christmas came and went and there was no change, they lost hope and often their will to live. These were the ones that suffered and died. The blind optimism they had was counterproductive, even fatal. However, those who confronted the brutal facts that they were in prison with no end in sight were able to endure and continue with an unwavering belief in an end result that they would get out despite their present reality. The principle in this story is that optimism disconnected from reality is useless, even harmful, whereas hope, even grounded in a harsh reality, can be sustaining. So hope is good. Optimism, not so much. The psychologist C.R. Snyder pioneered the development of hope as a psychological field of inquiry, and in doing so added further to our understanding of hope by clarifying the energizing expectation referred to by Dr. Redding. Snyder defines hope as, you see it on your screen there, the sum of perceived capabilities to produce routes to desired goals along with the perceived motivation to use those routes. Snyder's definition can be broken down into three component parts. First, the establishment of goals, individually or collectively. Two, perceived capabilities to create pathways for reaching the goals, including overcoming obstacles or creating alternative pathways when necessary. And three, the perceived motivation to use the pathways that will bring us to our goals. You'll notice the word perceived is important. We'll come back to that later. But keep that in mind. So Snyder's definition offers a structure and framework within which to think about and work on assessing and building hope. However, the challenge with hope, according to this, to this definition, 
is its application in a context where there may be little prospects of hope. Or it's not optimism, it's hope we're talking about. But the establishment of goals is the first step in the hope pathway. Is it possible to set a goal that one truly believes in when everything in one's environment and lived experience runs counter to the goal's objective? An example, Viktor Frankl wrote of what he called a provisional existence, which he defined as uncertain, meaning it was controlled by others, and unlimited. It was of no set duration. You had no idea when it ended. Frankl suggests that people who were unemployed, prisoners, or others could fit this description, and that one who cannot see the end of their provisional existence is not able to aim at an ultimate goal in life. Note the similarities between Frankl's description of a provisional existence and autonomy, the root cause principle we discussed earlier. In such a situation, it is very difficult to hope for a realistically achievable future goal, such as freedom if you're a prisoner, or an end to poverty if you're unemployed, without hoping in the prospect of a power or circumstance which can change the perceived nature of one's current existence and make the attainment of a future goal a realistic possibility. In this view, we offer the following amended definition of hope. Hope is the sum of perceived capabilities within an environment which allows their expression to produce routes to desired goals along with the perceived motivation to use those routes. This is not to say that hope should not be worked towards in situations where the environment makes its realization unlikely. What it does say is that any effort to address hope needs to take into account how the environment, social, cultural, political, or other type of environment acts to facilitate or constrain hope. This definition of hope adds a fourth component. Now we have first, an environment where goals, ideas, and alternatives have a realistic opportunity for achievement. Second, the establishment of goals, individually or collectively. Third, perceived capabilities to create pathways for reaching the goals, including overcoming obstacles or creating alternative pathways if were necessary. And fourth, the perceived motivation to use the pathways that will bring us to our goals. So based on this description and definition of hope, how is hope a root cause? Let's discuss hope as a root cause. The identification of autonomy, or how much control you have over your life, and social engagement and participation as important root causes by Michael Marmot was a noteworthy achievement. It traced the causal chain from behavior through to social causes and on to root causes. Although if you listen carefully to the discourse on these topics, social causes still seem to carry much more weight than root causes. For example, poverty is much more widely discussed than autonomy. Even though poverty's effect on autonomy is what makes it so significant. However, if we stay true to the logic chain which led us to autonomy or control of destiny is important, then the natural next question would be, how do we act to increase autonomy? What would bring a person or population to increase their exercise and experience of autonomy? A question worth pondering. There are many possible answers here, but one we settled on early was hope. We'll describe why. The reasoning being that the amount of hope a person or community has would influence how much autonomy they had or perceived they had. We were able to explore this in a paper for Health Canada a few years back, specific to the First Nations context, and continue to find hope a fascinating topic. One of the first explorations in the public health literature that we found of hope as a root cause was a study of adolescent substance abuse in San Francisco Middle School students in 1999. We studied adolescent substance abuse. You know, it's an area where a, a lot's going on. The authors commented on the many causes of adolescent substance abuse as follows, and I quote, Previous research has documented important relationships between adolescent alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use and peer influence, parental modeling, parental support, drug availability, perception of risk, school attachment, and social norms. Other researchers have found an association between students' exposure to neighborhood violence, decreased school attendance, poorer grades, and an increase of problem behaviors in school. 
the relationships between these risk factors and adolescent alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use are exacerbated by the social and economic context within which they occur. Parenting styles, for example, are influenced by neighborhood economic and social factors, such as adequacy of available neighborhood resources and level of neighborhood danger. The complexity of these interrelationships sometimes obscure the fundamental or root causes of problematic behaviors such as alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use." End quote. The authors point out both the dizzying array of causes, each itself a corresponding possible intervention point, and the opportunity of focusing instead on fundamental and root causes. I believe I counted 11 possible causes of substance abuse listed by those authors. If you have 11 factors and count how many times they can interact with each other in how many different ways, the number is staggering. But commenting on this study and the idea of root causes, one of the authors said, and again I quote, the focus of the funding agency was on cigarette smoking and other drug use, violence, poor school performance, sexual behavior, and so on. But we decided not to study any of those things. We decided instead to focus on the fundamental issues underlying all those problems. We decided to focus on hope. Our view was that if these children, mostly from minority groups and mostly from very poor families, had no hope for the future, what difference would it make if they smoked or used drugs or missed school or engaged in violent behavior? We decided to work on hope and to help these children see that they could have a future. And we decided to work with them over a three-year period to teach them ways of implementing their dreams, how to make things work for their benefit, how to select a problem and succeed in solving it, how to develop strategies for getting done what they want to get done, for having control over their destiny. These kids are not very interested in talking about smoking or drugs or violence, but they can become very interested in their own future. This is a very different approach than the usual project directed to smoking, drugs, and violence. End of quote. Results from this study found that adolescent substance abuse decreased with an increased sense of hope in a linear relationship, suggesting that as their sense of hope in their future increased, the risk-taking behavior decreased. In this project, hope was the root cause that made the project's impact more effective and longer lasting. Focused on alcohol abuse, for example, may effectively address alcohol, but if the root cause is not addressed, in this case a sense of hopelessness about their future, a decline in alcohol substance abuse may simply signify a corresponding increase in another problem area. The behavior may just shift behaviors without addressing the fundamental root cause. Another study consistent with the San Francisco study found using a sample of 2,468 inner city adolescents that hopelessness was associated with virtually every domain of risk behavior including violence, substance use, sexuality, and even accidental injury. The authors calculated odds ratios for these behaviors, comparing the behavior among those with high hopelessness to those with low hopelessness. You can see the odd ratios here. I apologize, this is a very busy slide, and the font isn't as, as big as it could be. If you see the risk behaviors on the left-hand column, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, physical fights, getting other kids to fight, carrying a knife, carrying a gun, pulling a weapon, cutting and shooting, gang membership, smoking, drinking, using marijuana, using cocaine, getting drunk or high, sexual intercourse, trying to get a girl pregnant, as a child, getting badly burned, getting accidentally cut, breaking a bone. Well, it's quite a list of risk behaviors. And if you look at the odds ratios, both for males and for females, you can see the higher risk among those with high levels of hopelessness compared to those with low levels of hopelessness. The numbers are quite high. The researcher who did this research commented on it and concluded quite strongly that prevention and intervention programs designed to reduce adolescent risk behaviors can produce desired outcomes only to the extent that they address hopelessness. Many health promotion programs attempt to empower individuals with the skills and the confidence to engage in healthy behaviors, based typically on the health belief model or social learning theory. 
Both of these models and many of the programs they have spawned assume that the individuals they target can imagine a positive future that can be achieved by engaging in healthy behavior. For those who are hopeless about their futures, these assumptions are questionable." End of quote. This researcher also emphasized the position of hope as a root cause of adolescent behavior. I'd like to add that we're also preparing a discussion paper on this topic. We're going to add the perspective of systems thinking as a way of examining hope as a root cause. This discussion paper is being finalized. It will be available in the next one to two weeks. We'll post it on our website and be sure to share it with all the participants of this webinar as well. So given our discussion of hope and what it is, and hope as a root cause, let's talk about applying hope. You remember the sensitivity mentioned earlier to the so what question, the question of what practical application research into health inequities had. And they're so closely linked to social inequities. You know, if the design assignment is fixed society, it's almost overwhelming. HOPE offers a program and policy perspective that is very actionable and consistent with the need to address social inequities and social problems in order to improve health inequities and health status. So how does this work? HOPE, as we discussed, is the root cause of health and well-being. As a root cause, it is on the causal chain for many risk factors and determinants. As a very simplistic example, adolescents drink. Adolescent drinking is caused by their peer influence. Their degree of effect, being affected by peer influence is influenced by how they perceive their own ability to control their life towards a future focused goal. And the amount of perceived control or autonomy they have relates to the amount of hope they have. It also works in reverse. If one wishes to make an impact on an issue or indicator, such as substance use, hope can offer a more proximal or immediate focus for impact. An example, the issues of homelessness and poverty in Canada have recently received attention in the form of community 10-year plans to address them. Great idea. The time frame of 10 years is chosen as these issues are difficult and to make real progress on them takes time. Early child development is another example. British Columbia's 15 by 15 policy framework talks about a period of 11 years before the investment in early childhood will begin to show impact in the economy, to show a return on that investment. For these and other issues where there's a delay between effort and impact, HOPE offers a focus with more immediate, measurable impact. Applying a focus on HOPE with any of these or other issues offers a more immediate target. This works because HOPE is a malleable construct and open to intervention. The psychologist Snyder, who we discussed earlier, said, and I quote, getting the human hope machine moving does not necessarily take a major overhaul in which one's goals, agency, and pathways all need to be simultaneously changed. Often, changing only one component will serve as a catalyst for change in other components. For example, a person's sense of agency and pathways may appear merely by clarifying a goal. Likewise, if a person becomes cognitively energized for a goal, shortly thereafter the pathways related to attaining that goal also may appear. Or, if the individual is filled with cognitions about pathways to a goal, the cognitive and physical energy to pursue that goal probably will appear. This interplay between goal setting and the agency and pathways components is prevalent in many people. Thus, even though people may encounter profound difficulties in life, the chances of restarting the hope machine are often favorable. Given this description of how the process of building hope works, kind of like tuning an engine, we can see that hope can be targeted and impacted in the short term as well as the long term. So for an issue that has, for example, a 10-year time frame, adopting a perspective of hope for the strategy offers a focus that can show impact and change within the first year and in the short term. As an aside, hope is a very measurable idea. There are well-defined, validated, reliable measurement tools that exist, and we've described them on our website and will in our discussion paper as well. Change strategies benefit from being able to show quick results. So making the case that hope is the root cause for your issue and then showing how a focus on hope can lead to progress on your issue opens the door for a shorter time frame for impact. We reconsider the example of adolescent substance abuse. If one was targeting substance abuse, adding a focus on hope 
provides an opportunity of showing more immediate impact on levels of hope within adolescents as a precursor to eventual impacts on substance abuse. And showing impact earlier helps to build support for continued attention on and investment in an issue. Similarly, with poverty or homelessness, these are difficult, complex issues. A 10-year plan offers a time horizon where a lot of activity can happen. Adding a perspective on hope to the 10-year strategy offers a perspective that can be measured in the, the very near future, not just at 10 years or five years or later, saying how much of a difference have we actually made in homelessness or in poverty. If hope is a root cause for poverty, for homelessness, then you can approach it that way as well. So hope can be applied this way for both program and policy strategies. So adding a framework for a perspective for hope. So what does a framework for the development of hope look like? Hope is of interest and its application in showing shorter term impact on an issue potentially useful. How do we apply it? We've developed the framework to guide the development of hope. Framework approaches hope as a participatory, inclusive change catalyst and process. If you remember the definition, we highlighted the keyword perceived, perceived pathways and perceived motivations, for example. Perception, by definition, is self-reported. So hope requires a participatory, inclusive process where those affected by an issue are the same who report on the issue and progress towards hope within the construct of the issue. We call this development of hope. Let's consider the term development for a moment. Amartya Sen wrote a great book called Development is Freedom. He's an economist who won a Nobel Prize. He described development as, quote, a process of expanding the real freedoms that people enjoy, of the removal of various types of unfreedoms that leave people with little choice and little opportunity of exercising their reason agency. Greater freedom enhances the ability of people to help themselves and also to influence the world, end of quote. Applying this perspective on development to the development of hope is consistent with the focus of hope as a catalyst and root cause that can increase autonomy or freedom to choose. Definition and classification of freedoms and unfreedoms is by necessity a bottom-up inclusive participatory process where those affected define and point attention to the barriers or unfreedoms that get in their way. Not unlike a recent story I heard about planting potatoes beside a food bank as a way of introducing healthier food into people's diets. Only to find months later in doing a follow-up evaluation that in most houses the bags of potatoes had not been used and were still there. The reason being, the, the real issue was people didn't have working stoves or access to natural gas or know how to prepare the potatoes. In short, they had not been asked what they needed or what would be helpful to them. Their unfreedom did not consist of a lack of potatoes, but of deeper issues. They had simply not been asked. So connecting Amartya Sen's concept of development with hope, the process for developing hope consists of a number of key ingredients. One, vision or purpose. What is the desired future state we are trying to achieve? Two, goals. How do we get there? Can we break it down into concrete steps? It has to be realistically achievable. Three, the pathways. There has to be a way to get from the present to the future. Four, motivations. Sometimes a pathway exists and the pathway isn't used. This can be because of previous experiences, previous attempts, any number of things. If you consider trauma, particularly in First Nations context or learn helplessness, ideas like that, um, in this perspective, they can affect people's motivation, their willingness or ability to try something new, something difficult, something that requires change. Mentorship. In the example in San Francisco, middle school students, in an inner city environment, the norm was for people to abuse substances and not to have much of a future. They brought in mentors from that area who could work with middle school students and show them that a different future was possible. Sixth, the environment. We, this is the piece we added to the definition of hope, that 
if we're focusing on how to increase hope as a way of increasing autonomy, there needs to be consideration of the environment, whether it be social, cultural, political, or other forms of environment that can make that process more likely to, to happen. Let's discuss these steps in this framework. Hope development, I don't want you to think of this as a linear process. It doesn't necessarily have a beginning, a middle, and an end, or follow a sequence from one to two to three, and so on. Instead, it's a process similar to system change, where the current state of hope is assessed along with each of its components, and intervention points identified that can work to increase hope. Now, this process can be applied with individuals, companies, organizations, or communities. It can be considered a planning process as well as a transformational change process. And depending on your issue or context or situation, your focus may shift to a more amenable ingredient as an initial focus. It may be, for example, that the cultural or social environment needs to be addressed to help make hope more possible, breaking down barriers or unfreedoms, as Sen described them, that leave people with little choice and little opportunity of exercising their reason agency. For example, if healthy eating's an issue, you, know, you need to look at food security. What barriers are there that get in the way of people accessing a healthy diet? Maybe that goals, another piece of the framework, need to be your focus to change blind optimism, the I hope I win the lotto type mentality, into something real and tangible and actionable, consistent with the vision for a changed future. It may be that pathways need to be co-developed, that the people affected by an issue know where they need to get to but need help in getting there. For example, help with public policy advocacy to adjust a system to better fit their needs or opportunities. It may be that a vision needs to be articulated with the help of mentors to show that something is possible and doable. An assessment of each of these components and their state can help to show where things may be working and where attention would need to be focused in order to develop hope. We'll be including an assessment guide in our discussion paper, and again, we'll be sending that out within the next week or so, uh, on our, both on our website and to the webinar participants. I mentioned before that hope is measurable. There are multiple hope measurement scales, both for adults and children, that have been tested and shown to be valid and reliable and useful. We can share those as well in our discussion paper and with any who are interested. Now, in the literature on hope, it's been applied in fields as diverse as human resource management, leadership, organizational behavior, criminal justice, resiliency, and even sales, in addition to public health and wellness. Hope, levels of hope have even been associated with increased profits and better satisfaction and retention rates among employees. The bottom line type indicators that businesses tend to appreciate the most. Common threads among these are the need to create capacities for a different, improved future and a focus on root causes of an issue that can catalyze and sustain progress and show more immediate impacts and indicators of progress. I'm going to stop here and conclude our presentation portion of our webinar for today. I know this has been a really brief introduction and overview of the topic of hope. It's one of these topics you could do a PhD dissertation on and still feel like you're skimming the surface in so many different ways. I hope you found this intriguing and are looking forward to exploring hope as a root cause and the development of hope as a change strategy that can be useful in helping people and addressing inequities and social issues. I'd like to open up now to take some questions. If you have a question, um, remember go to the My Mood indicator there on the top and raise your hand. Just let me know that you have a question and then you could either Ask your question or type it into the... Uh, All these are unmuted. I've just unmuted everybody, so you should be able to talk now if you wish to. So if you wish to uh, type in a question in your chat window or, or raise your hand and ask your question out loud, if raising the hand just gives us the ability to have one person at a time speaking, that would be appreciated. So questions at this time. Joanne has a question. Where can more information be found on the framework? We'll be des describing the framework in a much more detailed way in the discussion paper we'll be circulating. 
Uh, as I mentioned, hopefully in the next week or two, we're just finalizing a few things with it. So we'll be sure to send it to everyone who registered for the webinar, as well as posting it on our website. And the framework's based on our own experience and research related to hope. Any other questions? The fun thing about hope, I find, is it really is just kind of you get that feeling that you're just peering over the edge or around the corner into a, a large and exciting room and trying to um, get a sense of, of how this works. And that sense really comes to, from experience, you know, working with the topic. Another question from Mandana, can we have access to this webinar again? I joined a bit late. Most definitely. I'm recording the webinar, and the webinar will be made available on our website. And again, I'll, I'll let people know as soon as that recording is available. Shauna asks a question, do you see a relationship between hope and resilience? A great question. Could you perhaps give me a, an example of where you would see resilience? that we could explore together, Shauna. To give your questions some context. Shauna says, we've been looking at resilience and positive mental health. Well, if you remember the, the definition for hope, let's start there just to discuss a relationship between resilience and hope. Um, we added that piece about the importance of environment, just recognizing that for some people, imagining a different future is a difficult enough task on its own. You know, if I've grown up in a household or a community where, you know, you remember the chronic stress response and how it relates to, to health, and health status, you know, if, if my life has been one of chronic stress and, and it literally ages my immune system and my organ systems and makes me unhealthier, you know, I'm less likely to respond to an opportunity because uh, I'm just so used to being overwhelmed and trodden down. So the, from that perspective, you know, people who are resilient will be much more or in a much better position to explore hope, to say, how can we work with this framework and work with the pathways and the other pieces of the model of hope to leverage hope and help change happen for them individually and for other situations as well. Shauna comments, what you were talking about reminded me of it. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from adversity, definitely. I think from that perspective, perhaps we could look at resilience as an enabler for hope. People who are resilient are more able to experience hope and explore hope. Thank you for that question, Shauna. So back, there's a question from the health equity team from Alberta Health Services. Hello, folks. Can you expand a bit on the measures for hope? Great question. Um, short answer is yes. I'll be describing them and including them uh, in detail as an appendix in the discussion paper where you can see the actual measurement scales and see um, see them together. I do have on our website uh, a table where the different measurement scales are compared. You can see their purpose, their audience, uh, comments and measurements, for example, Cronbach's alpha about their val validity and reliability, uh, different things like that. So I think the best thing for me to do would be to share that with you and then we could have a bit more discussion about the different measurement scales and how they're applied. And again, that will all be included in the discussion paper. That will be included. Matt asks a question from Thunder Bay. I think Thunder Bay has got better weather than Alberta these days. Do you feel that hope can exist within the context of a rigid biomedical approach to mental health service delivery? It's a great question. So by a biomedical approach to mental health service delivery, would you consider that um, an approach that is very focused on prescriptions and treatments um, to try to 
control symptoms or crises, that sort of thing. Matt comments, focused on deficits, maintenance, and symptom reduction. Good. Okay. Can hope exist within that context? Well, if you think back to Viktor Frankl, and we commented on his comments about a provisional existence, an existence where one doesn't feel that they have any control over it, and they feel that it's of indefinite duration. I think perhaps if we layer that definition onto this context, um, uh, a biomedical approach to mental health service delivery, perhaps how they could work is as um, a person who is experiencing mental health difficulties or crisis is stabilized through a biomedical approach, and that gives them foundation. But it takes them out of that sense of provisional existence, where they have some control over their life. They have, they see an end in sight. They see some stability. They see a sense of safety. From there, they're able to explore hope, perhaps in the big picture, the little picture, and especially for others. You know, if you if you know somebody with a mental health uh, situation, uh, it's very difficult, especially for their caregivers or family. It can be the most difficult thing one experiences and goes through. Uh, so, for from that perspective, both for the individual who's affected and for their immediate uh, relationships, hope can be applied there uh, concretely within the biomedical model, and we can do something to help this person, if indeed that is the case, if they have an accurate diagnosis and other things. And that can you know, eliminate the crisis, bring some stability back, bring some uh, safety back, and from there, other things can be explored. Matt comments, I would worry that services end with maintenance and stabilization versus discussing individual recovery and the power of hope for the future. Great comment. And if you remember, hope development, you know, the whole process of development, as Amartya Sen described it, it's a process of expanding the freedoms that people enjoy. And removing the unfreedoms that act as barriers in their life. So applying that perspective of hope development in mental health would require going far beyond maintenance and stabilization. That would just be the initial step. Great question. Let me go back up here. I think there was another question. Scrolling through the questions. Chris. Uh, there we go. Would the measures for hope not be reflected on the actions of the person or group you are working with? Example, a person suffering with addiction moves to consider considering counseling, then moving to next step of treatment. Good question, Chris. So if I understand your question right, you're asking the context, the, the social circle almost, that a person's with or their environment would reflect their level of hope or hopelessness. If I'm understanding your question right by describing it that way, I would say most definitely. And again, that's just one reason we added the environment to the definition of hope to emphasize its importance. You know, what one source we draw hope from is the example of others around us. If I have a challenge and I can see how somebody else has addressed it or been successful, you know, despite the challenge, for me it creates a possibility that I can do the same thing. You know, and we talked about hope as a catalyst. It's a catalyst for change. It's a catalyst for progress towards a future state. You know, when you can see that working for others in your circle or in your context, it most definitely should affect your motivations as a piece of hope. Your context hopefully would also help you as you go along pathways. Motivations is just a piece. You have to take actions. So as you're going along a pathway from your present to a goal that's consistent with the vision for a different future, we all know pathways are fraught with problems. So hopefully your context and your circle would be very helpful in either walking that journey together with you or helping you overcome any obstacles or even considering or taking alternative pathways instead necessary. Great question. Just looking at time, uh, in the interest of time, I definitely don't want to keep anybody over time, but I appreciate the question and the chance to discuss this. I'd like to just move on past the question and answer. 
to cover a few last things related with this webinar. One, as I mentioned, we've recorded the entire webinar, and it will be available on our website uh, shortly. And I'll be sure to email all participants so you can know where to find it if you need to listen to it again or share it with any others that you think may be interested. Uh, also, as I mentioned, you know, we're preparing a discussion paper about hope as a root cause and hope development as a framework. We'll be sharing that. I do want to mention, if you're new to our webinars, uh, our four-hour rule. If you've been to a webinar before, we've described this. Now, this comes. This is inspired by Google. If you're familiar with Google, they do really cool things. I just uh, heard an article recently that they've sent up balloons high into the atmosphere that they control, and these balloons through radio waves are designed to provide internet access to remote areas. Just one example of the cool things they do. That's not what inspired us. Um, what inspired us was they have a 20% rule, where they give their engineers the autonomy to focus 20% of their time on their own ideas related to their work. This is where Gmail came from, you know, Google News, and other good ideas that Google has. So here at Equiate, we have adopted a similar practice. We call it our four-hour rule. Basic idea is that every week we set aside at least four hours where we focus on talking with others about their issues and their work as a means of offering an opportunity for reflection and dialogue for those working in the field. At present, with these webinars, we're dedicating our four hours to follow up from our webinars. So what that means, if you found HOPE as an interesting idea or have additional questions about it or would like to explore it, we're available for conversations through this four-hour rule. The best thing we do is just to send me an email, it's there on the screen, and we can book a time that works and have a good conversation. We'd also appreciate your feedback on today's webinar. We'll be sending you a, a link to a very brief survey, evaluation survey, about this webinar. If you took the time to complete it, we'd appreciate it as it helps us to improve what we do and make sure it's useful and relevant to the audience. So thank you again for your participation today. We look forward to continuing this conversation with you about hope as a root cause and the development of hope as a strategy for use in program and policy work. And we look forward to possibly seeing you in our other webinars for those working to solve health and social problems. Again, my name is Steve Peterson with Equiate, and I thank you for your participation today. Thank you.